In this video, we're going to take a look at how to determine statistical significance for the Pearson correlation coefficient. So we just learned how to determine if our relationship is linear by finding the Pearson correlation coefficient. And when we did so for a population, we called that rho. And when we did so for a sample, we called it r. And so what we're going to do is we're going to determine not just is this a linear relationship, but is it statistically significant? Now there's two ways to do this. One way is the way they focus on in the textbook, and that is to find a critical value using a table. And I detest tables, so I don't do it that way. So if you wanna do it the way they show you in the textbook, feel free. I'm going to show you how to set up Excel to do it as, as usual, um, so that we don't have to do as much work because I'm very lazy. So step one is to write our hypotheses. Now, if you'll recall, when we talked about rho, we said rho had to be between negative one and positive one inclusive. And if rho were negative one, that indicated a perfect negative relationship, negative linear relationship. And if rho were positive one, that indicates a perfect positive linear relationship. So our null hypothesis is that rho is equal to zero. So if you'll recall, the perfect relationships were closest to one and negative one. And as you got closer and closer to zero, that's when there was not a linear relationship. So that is why that is our null hypothesis. Our alternative hypothesis is not equal to. And the reason that it's not equal to is because we are not asking, is it negative or is it positive, but we're asking, is it one of the two? So the less than side would give us the negative and the positive side or the greater than side would give us the positive. Now to do this, of course, we're going to have a test statistic as usual. And one of the values in our test statistic is R. Remember, we just used Excel to calculate this. We found that in our last video. Now, of course, we'll do it again, but that's the correlation or the Pearson uh, functionality in Excel. And then we also have um, divided by the square root of one minus r squared. Again, r is still that same value and then divided by n minus two. You might also see your t test statistic look like this, r times the square root of n minus two divided by the square root of one minus r squared, which is just an algebraic manipulation and it's the exact same equation. So when I write it, excuse me, when I put this in Excel, I'm going to put the function in Excel this way, just so that you're not confused. All I did was rewrite it algebraically. And then of course, as before, we're going to find a p-value. And because we are looking at a two-tailed p-value, we're going to write t-dist two-tailed for t and degrees of freedom. And keep in mind, if t is negative, um, Excel tends to not like that. So I'm going to actually use the absolute value of T um, for T. And then the degrees of freedom is N minus two. We're going to draw our conclusion the same way we have before, reject if P is less than alpha or fail to reject if P is greater than alpha. Keep in mind that we're not just rejecting and failing to reject. We're saying if we reject, there is a significant relationship. And if we fail to reject, there is not a significant linear relationship. So we're going to take a look at an example together and I just wanna talk about it before we pop over to Excel to do everything that we need to do. So we're going to use the hypothesis test instead of the critical value to determine if the linear relationship between the number of parking tickets a student receives during a semester and the student's GPA during the same semester is statistically significant at the 0 0.05 level of significance. And now we're looking at the table right here and we're going to have that data already in Excel for us so we don't have to enter it in ourselves. Now, before we actually do the test, I'm going to create a scatter plot with you. It's always a good idea to create a scatter plot so that you can verify that there is in fact a linear relationship because if there's not a linear relationship, we do not want to move forward with any of these testing, uh, any of these tests. Now, there's really no dependence of one variable upon the other. So I can't say the number of tickets would affect GPA or the GPA would affect the number of tickets. 
So we're just going to randomly assign them to say, let's let the number of tickets be X, the explanatory variable, and the GPA be Y, the response variable. So when there's no relationship that is clear, it's okay to choose one. Let's take a look at how we can now set up Excel to do our work for us. Now, the first thing I wanna point out is, yes, I've already set up the cells, but I'm going to take you through them. Um, but before we do that, it's always a good idea to take a look at a scatter plot and determine should we even use a linear model. So again, I'm just highlighting the two columns. I've made sure to put my X values in the first column and Y values in the second column. And then I'm going to choose scatter plot. And I can see from the scatter plot that it, it isn't an amazing relationship. We have, um, but we do have a bit of a linear trend going down from left to right, so that's a negative linear relationship. Again, I wouldn't call this super strong um, because as we can see, there's a lot of scatter. But it's close enough to go ahead and continue with our test and then we will let Excel help us to determine whether or not it's significant. So things that we will need to calculate our T-score. The first thing is R, and R is just the correlation coefficient, so we can either use Coral or Pearson. Uh, as we talked about in our last video. Then there's R squared. So we haven't done this one yet. Um, R squared is, there is actually an R squared value. So I could just take R, whatever this value is in the cell and square it, and it would give me the exact same value. But I'm going to go ahead and use R squared. And the important thing here, RSQ, notice it asks for the known Y's first and then the known X's. So you have to choose Y's then X's, otherwise that value is not going to be correct. For the N, remember N is the count of pairs. So the only mistake that I see students make here is to count A and B, and I don't want that. I want to count either A or B because that would account for the number of pairs of data. If you'll notice, all of these are going to be calculated for me based on this data. So really, I'm just going to be copying and pasting data to put in these columns, and these three are going to populate with the solutions. This value is a value that I must enter, and our question asks us to use an alpha level of 0 0.05, so that's what I've entered here. The degrees of freedom, again, this is something that's going to be calculated for me, and the degrees of freedom is n minus 2, so notice I'm just taking the n value and subtracting 2. And then the t-score, I'm just using that formula. That formula says take r, which is e2 in my case, and divide it by the square root of, I'm sorry, multiply it. Remember I kind of adjusted that equation, so I'm multiplying by the square root of n minus 2, which is the degrees of freedom. So I've taken e2 times the square root of the degrees of freedom, and then divided by the square root of one uh, minus E3, which is R squared, one minus R squared. So again, I could put it in that way, or I can also just put it in exactly as it looks, R divided by, uh, R, R divided by the square root of, and then I would need one minus R squared divided by the degrees of freedom. Notice it gives me the exact same thing. So you do you, pick the one you want. P-value, again, we're going to use um, T-dist, two-tailed. And so that I don't have to worry about a negative T-score, so notice here I have a negative T-score, and Excel doesn't love that. So I'm just going to use the absolute value of whatever I get for my T-score and then comma E7, which is the degrees of freedom, and that gives me my p-value. Now, previously, I always used reject and fail to reject, but in this case, I'm going to use significant or not significant. So again, I'm still just comparing p to alpha, so if E9, which is p, is less than alpha, again, we would reject the null, which means it's significant. So instead of reject, I put significant, and then Otherwise, I'm going to put not significant. So again, that's going to help me. And notice the only thing I had to enter is the data in A and B and the alpha level. 
everything else is calculated for me. I still need to understand what it is that I found though. So now I have to draw my conclusion. And my conclusion is that with P less than alpha, we reject the null. There is a significant linear relationship between the number of parking tickets a student receives during a semester and that student's GPA. In our calculation for whether or not this was significant, we did find a value called R squared, but we haven't talked about what it means. So the coefficient of determination is R squared, and it essentially measures the proportion or how much the proportion of the variation of the response variable. So how much Y changes that can be associated with the variation in the explanatory variable. So how much of the changes in Y are accounted for by changes in X. So here's an example that will hopefully help us to make sense of this. So let's say we found the correlation coefficient, which is R, not R squared, the correlation coefficient for the relationship between the number of cups of hot chocolate sold at an outdoor skating rink and the average temperature outside for that evening is R equals negative 0.65. Now, what does that tell us? That tells us as the number of, uh, as the average temperature outside goes up, the number of hot chocolates sold goes down and vice versa because it's negative. How much of the variation in the number of cups of hot chocolate sold can be associated with the variation in temperature? So R is the correlation coefficient. We want the coefficient of determination, so let's square it. R squared is 0 0.04225, which we write as a percentage, so 42.25 or 42.3%. What that means is about 42.3% of the changes in the number of hot cups of hot chocolate sold can be associated with the variation in the average temperature that evening. That's less than half. So what else might be determining the changes in the average number of hot chocolate sold? Well, we don't know, and we don't have to know, which is the good thing. All we need to know is that 42.3% of those changes are accounted for by the changes in the temperature. So we're going to go ahead and look at this next example together. And obviously I have, have it in blue, like, hey, go ahead and do it yourself. But if you've already set up Excel, really the only thing you needed to do was enter those data values in. And then everything else just calculates for you, which is fantastic. So the only thing I had to do here was to make sure my values in A and B, which were um, this is an example that we looked at previously in our last video where we were looking at age and reading level. So for instance, this nine-year-old has a leading, reading level of 4.1, which is one-tenth of the way through the fourth grade. Uh, the only value I had to enter then over here is just my alpha level, which was given to me as 0 0.025. Now, what can I say? Well, based on this data, I have a t-score that's very high. I have a p-value that's essentially zero, far less than alpha. And remember, when p is less than alpha, we reject the null. And in this case, when we reject, we're saying, yes, it's significant. Um, and if it's not, then it's not significant. But obviously, this is very significant. So it is a significant linear relationship. And then we are asked to determine the proportion of variation in the reading level that can be accounted for by variations in age. Now, that's the R squared value. Now, I want you to think about the difference in the last question that we looked at with R squared and this question. My R squared value is 97.8%. So what I'm saying is that 97.8% of changes in reading level, changes in Y, are accounted for by changes in age. So that's almost all of the variation is accounted for by changes in age. Before we move on, I do want to show you one more thing in Excel, and that is to use the data, data analysis regression option. Now, just a reminder, if you don't see data analysis up here, it's just an add-in. You have to go to File, Options, Add-ins, and enable it. Um, I've shown you how to do that in a previous video, so I'm going to assume that you've watched the previous video and have it enabled already. So I'm going to click on Regression and OK.
And when you're doing this, you want to be very careful about how you're entering your data. So notice input Y range. If I choose the entire Y column, which would be column B, and then the entire X column, which is column A, when I click OK, Excel will say, um, I don't think so, you have too much data. So it's better to just select the B values and then select the A values, I'm sorry, the X values, which are in column A. That way I don't have to click labels or constant is zero. I can click confidence level, I can click residuals, and then this one just tells Excel where to put the output. So I'm going to have Excel put it right here on this page because it's just easier to do um, so I don't have to click to a new sheet to show you. So when I click OK, notice it gives me a lot of stuff. Now a lot of this stuff we don't know yet um, and you'll see this same output um, in different videos as we move forward. But here are some of the things that we've already calculated for ourselves. Multiple R is our Pearson correlation coefficient and R squared is the R squared value. The other values, the ones that we have just found, is we have our t-score right down here, so our test statistic, and we have our p-value right here, and also right here, same thing. So those are the things so far that we know that, hey, we can just let regression do all of the work instead of you know, doing them piece by piece. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at the least squares regression line, which is the LSRL.